Hello, the so-called Fit for 55 package is supposed to be Europe's roadmap for a climate neutral economy. However, doubts prevail over whether the end result will deliver on much needed radical climate action in the EU. Can the package end Europe's reliance on fossil fuels? Is it just another exercise in greenwashing? And what went down today in the European Parliament in Strasbourg in the votes? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined by Finnish left MEP Sylvia Modig. Hi, Sylvia. How are you doing? I'm good. Happy to be here. OK. Uh, to start, before we get into the detail of Fit for 55, is the EU doing enough to prevent catastrophic climate change? Well, the EU is doing now more than ever, but that's not, that does not mean it's doing enough. So we are doing a lot. And it's true what uh, the Commission, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, is saying that EU has never done more. That is true, but it's still not enough. Because the problem with this whole thing is that we are not on the science-based road. And we have this problem in the climate law, which I personally think is the single one most important law in the whole Green Deal package. It is based on 55%. And that's what this whole package is based on, to getting us to minus 55% emission reductions by 2030. Uh -huh. And that is almost 10% below scientific advice. Okay. So that is the problem. And we are not even able to pass that. And this is a 55% reduction based on 1990 yes. levels. Not to get into too much statistics no, and stuff, but no. it's important, I think, yeah. No. Based but on this 1990. is the thing, this is the, the difference in, in, in the view points is that I come from a point when I think that the situation is so, it's an existential crisis for humankind. So I think there we will follow science. We will not make political deals that are against the science, that the target has to come from science, then the measures, how to get there, that's politics. Okay. Okay, so the Fit for 55 is this legislative package of different measures, uh, all intended to make the EU uh, fulfill its stated goal of being the first uh, climate neutral uh, continent in the world. Is today's voting so far helping in that aim or uh, actually counteracting it? Well, we are in such an interesting situation now as just the parliament uh, uh, did not approve of the ETS, the Emission Trading System proposal. And it means it's going back to the committee now. So, uh, and I'm happy it didn't pass because it was voted in a way that it would not have fulfilled our obligation. So I'm happy it went back to the, the committee, but the question of is it going to do be, be better or worse after this, that's too early to, to estimate. Okay. That we will see when we get back to the negotiation tables. Okay. Now, you've already said one of the, the main kind of acronyms, uh, pieces of jargon uh, that uh, are used around this, uh, this dossier, ETS, and you explained emissions trading system. Yeah. Um, I'll give you two more and maybe you can tell us what they mean. Uh, CBAM. Well, that's the carbon border mechanism. That is meant that when we get rid of free allowances and we have more strict environmental criteria, no one can produce a product outside the EU with less standards and then come into the inner market of the EU and get competitiveness like advantage because they produced in a way where they did not care about the climate. Okay. So it's like a border mechanism to put the price that you saved by polluting on the product so that they are a level playing field when they come to into our markets. Okay, so it's ETS, CBAM and Lulu CF. <laughs> That's the worst thing. That is land use and the change in land use. Mm -hmm. And the biggest question there is, of course, forestry and, and agriculture. Those okay. are the biggest drivers in that sector for the climate change and also for the biodiversity loss. But it's the Lulu CF we are voting tomorrow, uh, t today in the afternoon. That is, it's a question about the forests. How big sinks should we have in our forests? Meaning how much carbon the forests are able to absorb. Okay, okay. So you've, you've touched on it a little bit. There seems to be a lot of drama in today's uh, voting session and the votes are going to continue later on. But already we've seen uh, a lot of um, what looked like chaotic scenes in, in the chamber here in Strasbourg uh, during the voting. With vote, uh, reports being sent back uh, to the committee stage, um, like that's back in the parliamentary process, basically. 
Why did that happen? And what were you, what were you thinking during the votes? What, what was your approach there? Well, I would have in the end, uh, I decided because there was the ambition level uh, became worse than the committee position was. The free allowances were allowed a lot longer than the committee position was. Uh, nuclear was included in the, in the financing possibilities. There were so many things that made it really, really weak compared to the, the committee position. Uh, so that's what happened. And, and I know that, of course, drama like this is a big thing for us here in the House and politicians. But then again, this is just democracy. We come with a pro proposal and then we vote the substance. Do we want this sentence out or this in? Which percentage do we want here? And then if the end result is not good enough, then you press uh, minus, then you press red, then you say, no, 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 I will not approve it. And that's what happened. And now we go back and we start again, and that's just democracy. Okay. It, of course, it is a political failure for the rapporteur and also for, for the parliament, I would say. But then again, in the end of the day, that's just democracy. That's how it goes. If people are not happy with it, and then they vote against. Okay. Simple as that. Okay, and there's more kind of drama and uncertainty likely uh, in the votes uh, that are coming up uh, later on in the second session of voting, uh, particularly in the vote around the issue of CO2 emissions from uh, cars and vans. What's at stake there? Well, I am sure that the biggest question there is going to be the proposal on banning combustion engines by 2035. That is a very concrete question, and that is the one that I, I think is going to be the most important. Then there is another question about the, 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 the threshold level of, of the emissions, but I think that the, the banning of the combustion engine is going to be the biggest one. And usually I think in politics that politicians shouldn't uh, choose the winners when it comes to technology. I think you should let, in that case, the market and the people choose what they see as the best for them. But in this case, uh, we still see car companies coming up with um, investing in new combustion engines. And we know that if we ban them 35, there will still be combustion engines driving around for probably decades. Because that's the lifespan of a car, isn't it? You know, it's decades. So they're going to be around for a long, long time, even if we ban them at this moment. And that's a signal to the, the car industry that, hey, now it's time to invest in the clean options. Right. OK. We were talking just before <clears throat> uh, we started this about uh, corporate lobbying and the activities of corporate lobbyists, which, you know, they have been extremely active in the lead up to today's uh, voting sessions. Just a reminder to people uh, who are watching that lobbying the European Union is a one billion a euro a year industry with around 30,000 corporate lobbyists stalking the corridors of power uh, in Brussels uh, for their clients. Presumably, there's quite a few hundred of them who made the trip uh, down here to uh, Strasbourg. Um, and on these Fit for 55 files in particular, I mean, you've seen stuff from the aviation industry, from fertilizers, from metals, from the car industry that you mentioned. What are they looking for, these lobby groups? And have their messages, how have their messages been received uh, here in the parliament? Well, that, so if we look at the votes today, uh, and the votes destroyed the progressive ambition of, of the package, uh, you can say that the lobbyists got their message through. But of course, they all have different kind of, of, of exact things that they are looking for. But the big picture is that most of them just want to, to slow down the transition, slow down the, the dates of everything so that there would be a longer okay. time before you have to do anything. And this, in my sense, that's why I haven't been available for lobbyists this week, because I think it's so irresponsible, because the longer we wait, the longer we prolong the decisions, the more difficult they're going to be and the more expensive they are going to be also for the industry. So they are like, uh, in Finnish you say that you're sowing your own branch or okay. shooting yourself in your, le your leg and that's what they're doing. Uh, the winners of, of the future, the winners of tomorrow's are those who today are progressive and are in the front line of looking for clean options, investing, investing in, in clean possibilities and clean production. Those are the winners of tomorrow because that is, the whole world is going to that, that direction. We have to, because otherwise we don't have a planet. And I personally don't know about another good habitable planet than this one we are on. <laughs> so that is like the, where you should put it. But yeah, the lobbying is horrible here. 
uh, and and of course, to be honest, uh, an environmental NGO contacting me, that's lobbying as well. It's not lobbying only when, on, because lobbying uh -huh. has such a negative uh, connotation. And all usually you think about some, you know, like oil industry lobbying mm. you, but, but the environmental NGO, that's lobbying as well. Okay. So in the best possible scenario, a politician can get good knowledge from lobbying. Even if you don't disagree, if you agree, don't agree with the, the lobbyer, you can still learn from that sector, from that, you know, certain stakeholders position in that. And that can make you wiser in how to write the law, even if you disagree. Uh, but here you can hear so great lies that it's, it's, it's unbelievable sometimes. Right. And they, they, of course, have a lot more resources than the NGOs, Yes, and it is the oil that has resources, the cars, the forestry and the agricultural sector. Their resources compared to the civil society NGOs is right. yeah, yeah, yeah. too big. Yeah. If they would be equal, the situation would be a lot, lot, lot better. But they're unequal and the ones that have the resources are the ones that get to the tables where the legislation is written when the smaller with less resources can just come in when everything is already given out to the parliament and then try to, do you know what I mean? They get yes, it's to influence the, the before it's given and that's the biggest problem. Okay, so they've been at this for quite yeah, a while. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, Another big topic that's, I mean, linked to lobbying and has been lobbied on uh, a lot uh, from the corporate sector, but also a very national issue. I know France and, and, and Germany have been, the, both of those governments have been very active on it, is uh, what's known as the taxonomy. Um, and this is coming up on the agenda next week at committee level here in the parliament, and then in July uh, here in Strasbourg again at plenary level. What is uh, the taxonomy? If you'd care to explain that, uh, that'd be great. And then we can talk a little bit about what it means. Okay, so the f taxonomy is a sustainable, uh, a classification system for what can be seen as sustainable investment. And why we need this is that in the Paris Agreement and in our own climate law, we state that we must redirect all money flows towards the transition. And that's why it's really important because I personally think that this whole climate crisis cannot and should not be resolved with only taxpayers' money. I think the private money and the private uh, sector have to participate in the same degree. So this is a way to get uh, the private money to be invested in green and sustainable uh, projects and things that help our transition. Okay. So that's the whole <clears throat> but taxonomies and why we need it. And what happened then on the 31st of December 2021? Yeah, you make it sound like a crime happened. It's like a crime. <laughs> and where? And what happened? Well, it actually, it, it, it is kind of a crime. It's a political crime. What happened is that we have already agreed on the taxonomy regulation. What are the basis and criteria for something to be green? And then we left nuclear and gas outside because they were so sensitive and difficult questions that we thought it's better to take them separately. And then the commission came in the night of New Year's Eve with a com when nobody's working with the complementary delegated act where they want to classify both uh, uh, nuclear and gas as green. This means the commission wants us to think that natural gas, which is the probably the worst of the fossil fuels, should be green. So, I mean, uh, an elementary school child understands that there is quite, quite the, uh, a problem in this logic. So they came this proposal and there was no time for public discussion. There was no time for the civil society to comment or, or to have a debate on it. And now we then are trying to object to it. Okay. And something about the objection strength and the annoyment of the parliament can be seen through that we are from all party lines. Okay. This is the EPP and the left doing this together. Yeah. So this tells something because very seldomly we come together over the party group lines so largely as we have come in this question. Okay, so there's a lot more unity on yeah. that issue. And the problem is that we at this point when the commission gives a complementary delegate act, the parliament can only uh, say yes or no. Okay. We cannot say that we want to change it in this way. The, we can approve this if it is like this or if we include or exclude this. It's just yes or no. Okay. It, the pr proposal is what it is and it's only yes or no.
So that's what makes it difficult. And the one that makes it really, really tricky is that you have in the same delegated act, you have nuclear and gas, which are completely different kind of questions. Nuclear is much more, whatever any, anybody's opinion, let's not go into whether we are pro or not nuclear, but it's much more nuanced. There are different things at stake and gas is just so clearly, it's just a fossil, one of the worst, worse than uh, uh, CO2. It warms faster the climate than the CO2 does. Okay. So, and that cannot be. And if we now label this green, it means that we destroy the whole taxonomy. Because the one point of the taxonomy was to um, make greenwashing impossible. That you cannot say that, yes, yes, we are a green company, we do green investments. You have to show through the taxonomy, which is a science-based system, that we tick this and this and this box and therefore we are green. So it makes greenwashing impossible. But now the Commission with this delegated act want to destroy that part. Okay. So another major piece of... Yes, and uh, a completely political compromise from right. those countries that gas and nuclear is the most important for them. And of course one of them is France. And France being the presidency, country at the same time when they're doing this, I think it's it's very hard to understand. Okay, so no, another departure from science-based Completely, uh, against science-based. Yeah. Um, okay, Sylvia, we're going to let you go and continue. Uh, you've got a round of interviews, I think, to uh, take part in and continue the voting in the last of the sessions on the Fit for 55 files. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, you can stay up to date on our work on climate justice on our usual social media platforms and on our website, left.eu. Thanks, Sylvia. Thank you so much, David.